Hello everyone and uh, I am Dr. Deepthi and you know today we are going to discuss a new pattern uh, EQ question which is going to be based on the next pattern right so we are going to discuss a clinical case in obstetrics and gynecology particularly gynecology today and this is going to be a case on amenorrhea right so let's look at the uh, question so you know based on these new patterns where we expect uh, long clinical stem questions and we need to learn how to approach these MCQs right so let's see this so in this question we have a 32 year old woman who presents to the gynecologist eight months after delivery of a healthy baby with the concern that she's not had her periods her son was born at 39 weeks and the delivery was complicated by retained placental tissue which was removed by curettage she initially breastfed her child but then switched to formula feed after a few weeks because of convenience right she's not taking any contraceptives and her fsh level is seven international units so it's like a long clinical stem question of six seven lines so the first is the art of learning how to find out the keywords in such mcqs okay so let's try and approach how to identify keywords then we will see how to you know put those keywords together and try and reach to the answer okay so let's see what is the first keyword here so the first keyword that comes from the question is that the woman is now eight months post delivery and she has not started her periods right so post delivery if someone is breastfeeding then yes obviously they would not probably menstruate till the time they are breastfeeding but if the woman stops breastfeeding as happened in this case right then they should usually begin to menstruate by three months right so we are here dealing with a woman who is a case of secondary amenorrhea right and post delivery she has not started her menses despite the fact that she's not breastfeeding the child that's the first keyword here right now let's look at the next keyword the next keyword is that her delivery was complicated by retained placental tissue which was removed by curettage right so we we see that although it was a, 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 a you know a full term delivery but it was complicated by retained tissues and a curettage was done to remove these so now we have two clinical words we have a case of secondary amenorrhea right which we define as absence of menses for three consecutive months in a previously menstruating female and if she has irregular cycles then it would be for six consecutive months right then let's look at the next keyword the next keyword here is that she did initially breastfeed the child right so uh, she was able to breastfeed the child although she decided to switch over to formula feeding soon after so she, she just breastfed for a few weeks and that's what i said if the woman stops me, uh, you know breastfeeding the child then the menses should usually return by three months right whereas here she is not started to have her period despite the fact that she's eight months post delivery right so the keywords we have are we have a woman with secondary amenorrhea right and we've ruled out that breastfeeding is the cause of her amenorrhea and she has a positive positive history of curettage after delivery right let's see the next keyword the next keyword here is that her current FSH value is seven international units. So is that a normal value? Yes, right? So in normal reproductive age women, the FSH value should be less than 10 international units. And you know, the seven, uh, the value of seven international units is absolutely normal. And I will tell you why this value is so important. Now, when it comes to normal range, you can see it's a normal, uh, the wide, there is a wide range of normalcy. So one to 10, everything is going to be normal right so which means we should understand whether we are seeing values which are more towards normal or which are more towards suppressed values so one two three international units are absolutely in the normal range but you have to realize that they are very very low values they're suppressed values right so here it is seven which is more clo close to normal value for reproductive age women right now we have all the keywords so we have a woman i'm recapitulating for them you uh, for th those things right so we have a woman who has a case of secondary amenorrhea following delivery we have uh, in the history uh, you know it is positive for a curettage uh, we already know from the history that she did breastfeed the child so there was no failure of lactation although she switched over to formula feeding soon after 
and her FSH value is 7. So these are the keywords. So do you realize that although it was a 6-7 line MCQ, there are only 4 or 5 keywords in these. So we have put them together and now we will see how we approach the question. So the question says, which of the following is true regarding her workup for secondary amenorrhea? Now, once we have this, you know, a question with us, a secondary, a woman with secondary amenorrhea after delivery, what are the differential diagnoses we would want to keep? So we want to keep, maybe this is a fresh new pregnancy, maybe she is conceived again, because we all know that ovulation returns soon after and this woman was not in, uh, not using any contraception as well, right? So pregnancy could be one possibility. The second possibility can be Sheehan syndrome. So when you have a history of amenorrhea following delivery, we should think of Sheehan syndrome, right? The third possibility is Asherman syndrome, right? So delivery or abortion and following that, if the woman has amenorrhea, again, we should keep Asherman syndrome in the diagnosis. So, so these are the three most important differentials we have, right? So uh, I repeat, the differential could be a fresh new pregnancy, the differential could be Sheehan syndrome, and the differential could be Asherman. So we have to see which of these is it going to be. Now, how do we rule out a fresh new pregnancy? Which means, how do we rule out option D? So option D is going to be incorrect, right? So her workup will not be positive for beta HCG, but why? Do you recall the keyword that is related to this? Yes, FSH value of 7 international units. Now, in pregnancy, what's hap what happens is that the sex steroid levels are very, very high. The estrogen and the progesterone levels are very high. And they do a feedback inhibition. And in pregnancy, the gonadotropin levels, the LH and the FSH levels are very, very suppressed levels. They will be in the normal range, but they will be more towards the lower values. So, 1, 2, 3 international units is the maximum what you would come across for FSH in pregnancy. Pregnancy. So, which means this is not a case of fresh new pregnancy, right? Because the FSH is not suppressed, it is towards normal. So, that's how we rule out option D. She is not pregnant, so beta HCG would not be positive, right? How do we rule out option C, decreased prolactin levels, right? And in fact, I would take option A also together, absent pituitary on MRI, right? Which means if you look at option A and C, they talk about, uh, uh, you know, a pituitary gland not functioning normally, right? Now, what in the history or what keywords in the history tell us that the pituitary gland of this woman is functioning normally? Can you think of it? Yes, this was exactly the keyword. She was initially able to best feed, right? So, which means her pituitary gland is absolutely normal, right? So, the prolactin levels cannot be low, right? And even an FSH level of 7, which is normal, cannot be possible if the pituitary is malfunctioning or is not functioning. So, the keywords again, FSH levels towards normal and the woman was able to breastfeed, tell us that the pituitary gland is absolutely normal, right? So, which means option C, which says decreased prolactin levels is incorrect. Option A, right, which says absent pituitary on MRI. Now, what are we talking about? We are talking about Sheehan syndrome, right? So, now we all know that how does Sheehan syndrome happen? Now, it usually seen in postpartum women, you know, who've had massive hemorrhage, right and because of this massive postpartum hemorrhage the uh, the blood f uh, flow to the pituitary gland is not maintained and it undergoes infarction right and it's usually the anterior pituitary gland which is affected and it usually spares the posterior pituitary now because the pituitary undergoes infarction in she hands uh, it is going to shrink right whereas the cella is going to be normal size so you will typically see on mri an empty cella sign but in this patient we are ruling out Sheehan syndrome. So, which means absent pituitary on MRI cannot be a finding for this woman. But how do we rule out Sheehan syndrome in this patient? So, let's go back to the keywords. Yes, again, the important keyword, she is initially able to breastfeed. Uh, I'm sure you should all know that, uh, you know, Sheehan syndrome, the most common presentation is failure to lactate. So despite that the woman has recently delivered, she will not be able to breastfeed the child, right? So this particular keyword, which tells us that she was able to breastfeed initially, tells us that she is not having Sheehan's. There is no pituitary infarction. So there will be no empty cella sign. 
also please understand that in this clinical history that is given to us there is no history of massive pph we just tell you that there was retained placental tissue and we've done a curettage to remove it and that's about it so no history of pph no history of failure to lactation we've ruled out shehan syndrome which means we've ruled out pregnancy we've ruled out shehans and now we are left with ashermans right so what is the positive thing in the history here Yes, history of curettage. So you should be very careful when we give you a case of amenorrhea following abortion or following delivery, right? And there is history of curettage. You should think of Asherman syndrome, right? And Asherman syndrome is what development of intrauterine adhesions, right? Because of this curettage, right? There is healing with fibrosis, and there are going to be intrauterine adhesions, right? now what else in this history okay what keyword again in this history that this is likely to be ashermans can you tell me can you think about it yes fsh level 7 in ashman syndrome please remember there is no problem at the level of the ovary or at the level of the hp axis so which means the hpo axis the hypothalamus the pituitary and the ovary are normally functioning there's no problem there so the hormonal levels of these women are going to be normal as is depicted by the fsh level here so the hormones are going to be normal and still the woman is not able to menstruate because the endometrium is damaged by the excessive curettage right so now once you damage the endometrium the problem lies at the end organ which is the uterus whereas the hypothalamus the pituitary and the ovaries are normally functioning and that is why the answer to this question which says which of the following is true regarding her work up for secondary amenorrhea would become what what would the answer become that she would show a biphasic basal body temperature why right? because this tells us that the ovary is functioning normally so the hpo axis is functioning normally this woman would be ovulating and if she is ovulating she would show the biphasic basal body temperature which is brought about by the hormone progesterone right so that's the correct answer so that's how you approach so do you realize that how big the clinical question was the clinical vignette was it had almost 7 8 lines but i uh, you should learn how to take out the keywords so there were only four key things here we had put them together to rule out options as well as to rule in options and we approached the answer which is b biphasic basal body temperature right and also i would like to tell you here that although we are making a diagnosis of ashermans biphasic basal body temperature has nothing to do with diagnosis of ashermans it simply tells us that the ovaries are functioning normally or the hpo axis is functioning normally how do you now so maybe maybe next time we ask you the same question we would ask you what is the investigation you want to do for this woman right so the initial investigation that we can do is a saline infusion sonography right and where you could be uh, would be able to see the intrauterine adhesions but that's not the best modality to see intrauterine adhesions so the best way to confirm diagnosis so saline infusion sonography would help you reach close to the diagnosis but not confirm the diagnosis so what do you do to confirm the diagnosis hysteroscopy right so hysteroscopy is going to be both diagnostic and therapeutic right uh, diagnostic because you're going to directly see the adhesions therapeutic because you're going to break the adhesions there itself right so uh, this question had nothing to do actually uh, the mcq that we are asking you is not asking you to confirm ashermans we were simply asking you how do you reach to ashermans so here we reached to ashermans syndrome by ruling out the other uh, things right i hope you find this uh, question uh, clinical question discussion useful we would be doing many more such aq series based on the new pattern of exams which is next pattern which is going to be clinical integration of various things whether it is anatomy physiology or pathology so integration of basic sciences with the clinical um subjects right uh, please follow us on dams delhi youtube channel as well as an e medicos and you will have lots and lots of such eqs there we already have 100 plus eqs in this series so uh, you know uh, do follow us and do write to us uh, if you need any special topics uh, for your uh, eq discussion right so best wishes from the entire dams team take care